It is Saturday the 22nd of April 2023 and this is the Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hey everybody, welcome to the Future of Photography and uh, just me, Adrian, and my co-host and good friend, Jeremiah. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing okay. Uh, worked into the night, but uh, feeling no pain this morning. Uh, I'll be a little cloudy, but um, I think I it, w- it won't hurt my points of view and my um, focus on opinion. <laughs> That's the thing about vampires, isn't it? They're not allowed out during the day. <laughs> That's true. And as the nights get shorter, uh, the intensity of pace gets more uh rabbit so. oh yeah that's true because we're past the equinox now so you're into shorter nights and and that's it and when you're making a vampire show <laughs> <laughs> you got to get back into that you got to get out and into that coffin pretty fast <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, well, I, I'm glad to, glad you've been able to make it after a night's worth of shooting. That that sounds like pretty hectic, but but uh, kudos for your your commitment to the cause. Uh, yeah, that uh, is yes. the future of photography. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we're going to do um, we're going to do a, a short one actually today, or slightly shorter than usual one, um, and it's going to be a bit newsy. Uh, so yeah, there's a couple of things yeah to to talk about. Um, uh, you will put the the alert up for listeners up front. One of them does have some conversation about artificial intelligence in it, but actually it is very much about the uh about the link to photography, uh, particularly about link to photography competitions. Um, and uh, yeah, should we should we dive into that one straight away? Sure. Yeah. Um, what's interesting here is, of course, the big news in the photo front is that uh, a an AI generated image uh, looking beautifully photographic uh, won a competition wherein the photographer uh, refused the prize um, to create a controversy about uh, the position of AI so called photography and photographic contests, and he made a big deal about it, and it's still resonating within the community, both in the community of AI creators and photographers. Um, you know, I, f- I find this quite interesting in that uh, the, I guess, two, there's two sides to this. One is photographic competitions in and of themselves. Um, you know, you know, part of me feels, you know, a lot of these competitions are run as businesses. In other words, pay us, you can submit three, five, ten images, and uh, we'll tell you if you've won either a prize or a you know, kind of widely publicized um, kind of uh, positioning of your photographs in a popular website. Um, but it feels to me quite like a lottery because who's judging? You don't really know the judges and you don't know the circumstances of the choices as well. Um, it's not like the Academy Awards where one way or another, uh, the members of the fo- you know, of the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, we vote. You know, the directors nominate the directors, the actors nominate the um the actors and so so on, and we all vote on the final results of the nominees. Here, you just throw it in, uh, so it feels very much like a lottery. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's nice to see work presented online of images that you wouldn't necessarily get a chance to see. Um, but having said that, in these photo competitions, they don't usually outline very specific rules about editing. Have these photographs been editing? In other words, can you send your raw files? And we will judge the image based on the pure act of pressing the shutter button at a certain <laughs> time, not on the, the kind of experience of the editorial process of bringing out a personalized vision of what that image is. And where is the limit to that? In other words, is it just a little tweak of color, opening up a shadow, dropping a highlight, etc., enhancing color, saturating, desaturating, 
maybe. Or is it like, wow, this started as a photograph, but it is, you know, wild with effects and all manner of customizations. How we determine what the line between the purity of the photograph and the end result is often very much in the judge's uh, hands. And that's where the controversy starts to open up, AI being the most extreme because it uses photographic aesthetics of something I've talked about on this show endlessly. Um, the aesthetic of a photographer is a little different than the aesthetic of a painter. And so how much do aesthetics, technique, and decisive moments come in to the selection of a winning photograph in a prize? I think there's, there's, there's a lot in here, right? That it, uh, and it's a good opening, opening monologue. Yeah, a good opening monologue. The, I think there's a couple of things that, that jump out from this story for me. One is that uh, this relates to the Sony Photography Awards. Okay, so um, these are about, the, uh, and, and you can sort of, yeah, you can, there's three words there, right, that we, we could pick up on, right? So award. Okay, so yes, this is a competition. And yeah, a lot of competitions, you know, are, are definitely run for business purposes. Um, I don't know the inner workings of the Sony Awards, so so uh, I, I won't comment on those. Photography is, is uh, a good word as well to pick up on. Um, so photography for me, um, you know, may, call me a purist. Actually, no, I'm not a purist. I'm absolutely happy with you know, merging with digital art and other art forms as well. But photography needs to, I think, um, capture some light on some sort of sensitive material somehow. Uh, I think, you know, b broadly speaking, the definition of photography th these days includes capturing light on sensitive materials. That could be a film material. It could be a paper material. It could be uh, a digital sensor that is a sensitive material. It could be whatever. Um, so I think uh, a, a purely AI generated image uh, for me, doesn't include in the crafting of it any capture of light uh, on, on, on a sensitive material. Um, now, clearly, these AI models have been trained on tons and tons of actual real photographs. But I don't think the, the creator of an AI generated image, as clever and as artistic as they may be, and I know you've put a lot of effort in developing the art and the craft of AI generated images, for me, if you're not actually the person who is doing you know, the, the, the initial photographic work, I think it probably doesn't count as a photograph. But that's well, just a personal opinion. Yeah, let me challenge that a little bit. Not a lot, because so much of, of what you've just unpacked, I, I very much agree. There's a very different experience between heading onto the street with your camera, just being present, absorbing what you see, what you feel, what you're looking for, what you experience, and, and capturing that in a moment. And that really, it, and, and by the way, that could be for aesthetic pro processes. Um, it also could be for newsworthy it could be capturing memories of your children. What, whatever that is, there is a distinct, uh, I'll call it a feeling of the photographic process that pulls you into reality or <laughs> as somebody, some people would say so-called reality, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> believably, um, that is very different than approaching images uh, with the sole goal of creating something out of sheer cloth. So there, there's that distinction. Yep. Th though the end result is very much indistinct. So we are we judging an image based on what we feel when we watch it using a photographic filter in our minds? Or are we judging something using the technique of lenses, photosensitive material, et cetera. And is that important? So obviously, if you're doing something so abstract that it no longer feels like a photograph, and many photographs feel like paintings, 
you know, whether they're in deep macro or using all kinds of filters and overcolored saturation, abstract images, et cetera, et cetera. Are they photographs per se, you know, in, in, you know, in, in, I guess one could contrast or compare that with an image that looks absolutely realistic, shot on earth in a moment and has all the feelings of Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment. What is a photograph when you compare that? Are we comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges? So there's that. Um, to to kind of inform our, our aesthetic, especially when it comes to competitions. That's in, because that's what we're talking about. That's very much my um, my kind of bone to pick with this. Um, I, I'm not saying that photographic competitions shouldn't have limitations. Like I'm I'm assuming that if you entered uh, a uh, an image taken with an icon with all the EXE um, data into the Sony competition, would that immediately be rejected? I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm assuming it will, because it could be for images captured with Sony cameras, so that ultimately it is a marketing tool for uh -huh. Sony. Um, but, you know, putting that aside, uh, I think we have to ask ourselves what makes us feel, and because that's really the intention, that the image we are looking at is a quote pure unquote photograph. I this is um, I, I, I difficult difficult to consider the concept of a pure photograph. I think um, yeah, exactly yeah. so. So I, I'm quite happy to be fairly relaxed uh, about the the purity of things. I mean, yeah. So uh, for for all all the good reasons, right? So I don't know. So so let's let's talk about the Sony thing because this is the other thing. I, I don't have a great response to actually what you were saying now, other than to say yes, I I agree. In it's all hard, and and it's Sony. So Sony, right. So I only know really of the Sony Awards for two reasons. One is that they, they often exhibit in Somerset House in London. Um, and I have been once or twice. Uh, the other is their annual controversy. <laughs> so um, y y nobody ever says, nobody ever sees a headline that says, oh, by the way, the Sony Awards and there's some nice photos this year. Nobody ever sees a headline that says that. You only ever see the headline that says, oh, massive controversy at the Sony <laughs> Awards. Um, so I my, philosophically, I have to ask the question, you know, do the Sony Awards even exist without their annual controversy? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, to me, um, I, I don't find it within the realms of coincidence that you can have such controversies every year without fail. Uh, and so I have to consider that it's part of the event uh, and it's organized by the event organizers, right? The, the marketeers uh, in this. I can only consider that these things are there for that. And, and part of me wants to rebel, right? Because part of me doesn't want to be told that these things are controversial. Part of me wants to make up my own mind about what's controversial and what's not. It's a bit like being told what you should or shouldn't like. I, well, I, I think you just you just hit it on the head. Uh, being told by a judge and jury about what is supposed to make you feel a certain way about a certain aesthetic and a certain kind of genre uh, is very different from how you actually feel. Yes. So the you know the the image that that won the prize was really a, a beautiful image, and it could have been created with a camera inside a camera, uh, as you know as, as as much as it was created by AI. The question really is what are the origins of these kinds of images? Like if I run outside and snap a, you know, a, just a, a, a blind image of the, you know, the top of a rooftop, which could be a very bland, raw image on my computer, nothing interesting. And I, you know, I pull it into Photoshop or 
any number of dozens of, of photo editing software processes, I can transform that into something that doesn't even look like that rooftop against sky, but looks like just a, you know, a square uh, against a, a colored background, etc. So the origin, the DNA of it is in the capture mode. So however I take that springboard and move it into the most painterly abstraction, it still remains a photograph in the eyes, you know, I believe, of these jurors. However, if I take a photograph and use that as the DNA to create an AI-generated ap appearing as a photograph, is that less of a photograph than the abstracted one? And that's where I feel we are so early in this controversy, shall we say, that I do believe in, in years, I mean, you can call it a decade, it'll probably be less, that we won't be talking about that. It'll just be an image, however you capture it. Is it a hyper-realistic painting? Is it a photograph taken with your, you know, your snap cam, your iPhone, or is it an AI generated image? You know, the, the difficulty where my wife said yesterday, I'm just looking at things, I don't know if they're real or not. <laughs> yeah, when you, when you zoom in I the say, moon, it says Samsung present. on it, yes. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the present. I mean, and, and it's also part of my, my personal art uh, process, which is the, the the kind of blending of, of of what is truth it's really that 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 question what's truth what's history you know is, is it just so subjective and becoming more so or more obviously so because it, it it could be that that has always been the case history written by the victors etc do we only have a view of what is passed on to us not the quote reality if such uh, a concept exists. So uh, I'm very much um, opposed to siloing any kind of expression. I think at the end of the day, it's the image that counts, just like in politics, you know, it could say, you know, it's the economy, stupid, or, or whatever yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. The reductive process is really about how do you achieve an image that provokes a feeling, um, and that feeling could be different between people, but it's certainly very, very important much more important than, oh, did you shoot this on your iPhone? Well, if you shot it on your iPhone, it, it has no value uh -huh. because I used, yeah. uh, I used a Hasselblad, you know, the, or I used, you know, what we, we will discuss in a coming episode, a monochrome Leica at 8,000 pounds, you know. Does that make it more of a significant image? And so, Interesting stuff. Interesting. So, so uh, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah. I wonder if this is how painters felt in the 1830s and 40s when photography was invented. They did indeed. Baudelaire said this is the end of, of you know, of, of painting. This is the end of art. You know, he, yeah. he was very much against photography, uh, you know, thought it would just destroy everything. And what, what happened, though, interestingly, because painters, if you remember, were, were creating more and more and more realistic painting, like very, very, very realistic in terms of portraiture, in terms of landscape and in terms of architectural or historical detail. So that was all very, very uh, focused on recreating reality and how light falls on, um, on the earth. Well, what happens is with the advent of photography and all the controversy that, that existed then, what happened is there was a fork in the road and you have impressionism and abstraction. And so the art of painting exploded in terms of the personal expression of the interpretation of what reality was. So, so the <laughs> existential threat to painting from the advent of photography spurred lots and lots of... Uh, creative processes. Yes, creative processes. Yes. Interesting. 
Yes, and I, I think this will happen again. In other words, what I think will happen is with AI pushing photography, you know, to, photographers going, oh, my God, I'm not going to be able to do this, that, and the other. I think that we're going to see an evolution of both the technology and the expression and the aesthetic coming out of it. And I think that's true of probably most um, most things. In other words, if you're a writer and uh, are using GPT-3 or 4 to kind of help you or write for you, what we're going to find is there's going to be an expansion of mediocrity. In other words, everything will be in the middle. It'll be perfectly okay. fine. It'll be okay. But the tr truly brilliant ones will have to work harder to break through and do what only humans can do, which is just break through different um, ceilings in terms of expressions. And that, that could be in terms of writing. It could be in terms of scientific research. It could be in terms of certainly making art. So uh, I, I think we're in an interregnum right now, and, and that's why we are confused and, and there is a controversy. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll have to come back to this then, won't we? Because yeah, this this is going to evolve over time. So yes, but it in will. the meantime, you've yeah. got a couple of photos to talk about. Well, I did uh, because it, just addressing this specifically, um, uh, and and they'll be up on our site. I I, I, I was shooting last night, and I did just uh, take a, a snap with my iPhone of uh, my second AD Kendall uh, walking towards the camera. Um, it just seemed like a nice kind of snap for me to do. And the light was kind of interesting. And and the image is, you know, straight out, unedited, right out of the iPhone. Now, when I say unedited, what do I mean? It was pretty dark. Um, I had, obviously, there's some movie lights around, but it wasn't particularly composed lighting. Um, it was just there. I snapped it. The camera itself in the iPhone interpreted it. You kind of created an artificial high ISO sensitivity and made a quite a bright image. Well, I took that image and I processed it. I described it in words and uh, in terms of location and all the rest of it, and then ran it through with my own kind of processes through uh, I used Midjourney to create something that was based on the compositional elements and the light, but much more, um, I think, artistic. And in that, um, I just felt that if I compared the two images, I have a favorite. And so I present <laughs> both images <laughs> and ask, what images do you prefer and where do you think the reality and the uh, kind of AI version of the reality that was completely emerged from the actual iPhone photograph? Interesting. OK, so as we look at this, and as you say, link in the show notes, folks, um, the, the photograph of your colleague walking towards the camera is the one that you shot on your phone and the photograph or image of somebody walking away from the camera is the one that is the AI generated image from mid journey. Interesting. Very interesting. Indeed. If, if you were a judge on a photo contest, which one would you give a prize to? Well, so I will, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I it's, will very, it's a very interesting. So, so uh, I, I think, the, I mean, in terms of the the aesthetic, the the AI generated one clearly has no no offence to your delightful phone snap, uh, but the AI generated one clearly has the uh, the the more uh, nuanced aesthetic, right? The more sophisticated aesthetic. Um, you know, looking at it, um, it has possibly a few too many lamp posts, and they are bent in strange ways. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, but it definitely has a, a sort of Gregory Crudson, you know, nighttime suburban shot feel about it. And I had to, you know, honestly, um, I would have had to 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 look look at it 
more closely than I did in when we were prepping for the show uh, to to look at it and go, yeah, actually, you know, there are some artifacts in there that point to it not being a straight photograph, but something that has been generated. Um, you know, certainly at the sort of glance that you would give it in, uh, yeah, in scrolling through a, a social feed, sure, you you you, you would just uh, assume it was a photograph. Now, uh, with that. Uh, if I was going to take that image and and develop it as a piece of standing art, I would pull that into Photoshop because this this is just straight out of my iPhone. Both of these things, mm -hmm. I would pull it into Photoshop, multiple different uh, uh, processes, and I would fix all things so that you would never like. I would go through it literally, almost pixel by pixel, or or, you know, square by square and just adjust any giveaways, any tells using traditional photographic uh, technologies, you know, from Adobe on. And, and then I could, and then I, maybe I would print it using a light flex, a continuous tone color photograph on photosensitive paper. And there you go. Um, <laughs> I, and I would challenge you to say that that wasn't a photograph. So this is really interesting, right? And as ever, you you are you are pushing strongly into the grey areas, into the boundaries, and and playing with us all, quite frankly, aren't you? And enjoying every minute of it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, as am I. So it, this reminds me, in a way, of uh, years and years ago uh, on the Sunny Sixteen podcast. Um, I had a conversation with my co-host Graham on that podcast and I said, so if we shoot film in our cameras and then we bring it into a digitalized production workflow of some sort, um, that's a film photograph. Yeah. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, OK, so if I capture something digitally and I play with it, but I output it onto Instax, which is an inherently analog and of course is a film format. Is that still film photography? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's so funny that you say that because, you know, I'm on location here. I don't have much gear with me, certainly no printer. But I did bring my Instax Square uh, printer. And I have been printing these hyper-realistic images on Instax just because I, I am very... Um, I just lo love the print. I, I, I always feel that the image for me only exists when you can hold it. Uh, maybe, you know, call me old fashioned. No, no, it's all good. It's all good. I, I can appreciate the image on a screen, certainly the image itself. But the object for me feels slightly more significant because it's a marriage of feels more permanent i guess maybe that's it and yep. hence it feels that it has more hi historical value i'm not saying that the historical value is good bad or, or indifferent but but holding that image uh is a, it's a very different response you have and when i print some of these very realistic i'm currently working on a reportage um, the folio that it looks like, you know, you're kind of hanging out with gangs of kids and, you know, by the river's edge and, you know, along train tracks and, 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 and they're purposely kind of not well composed. There's half, you know, they just look very, very random, maybe the way Bruce Davidson used to shoot or, you know, <laughs> the, those kinds of, of things though, color um, and, and, when I print them small on Instax, it they look like photographs. You know, they, they are very challenging and confusing to our current aesthetic. But um, I think that we're just in a kind of a period where, A, on the positive side, uh, we will just appreciate those images for what they are. But on the negative side, we will no longer trust anything we see um. <laughs> as being actually real. And, um, and that's kind of been the, the um, I guess, the, the, the kind of thrust of my work over the last decade, certainly, maybe longer. Yes, it's, it is. It gives us all something to think about. If you take a photograph and then you use generative devices as part of 
your post production workflow, which is you've yeah. done the photos that's you just talked doing, about. Yeah. Is it still a photograph? But do we not do all of us do that quite a lot? If anybody's out there using you know a, a photo editing software tool that yeah that they've bought a license for that does sky changes or, or lighting changes yeah interesting well I'll give i'll give you another one and we'll go to your pick um there's controversy about copyright protection of ai generated images so i said like what if you make an ai generated image which these are all legal economic controversies not really creative uh but but if you have a, an image generated by purely by AI, by machine, you put it up on the wall and you take a photograph of it, <laughs> is that photograph copyrightable? As not, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll yeah, leave you I, with as, that. as ever, the legal system will take a while to catch up with the, with the, with the artists. <laughs> okay. What's your pick? Well, I, I've, I've just got something. This is this is um, uh, a quick story that I thought it, it'd be. It, it popped up in my news feed, and uh, I just thought it would be nice to acknowledge it and and break the fourth wall of podcasting for for just a short while. Um, the link in the show notes. This is a, a link to an article on the BBC. Um, so it's B, a BBC news article, albeit in their entertainment section. Um, and uh, it asks the question, um, is the have a go podcast era coming to an end? Now, I've been having a go for a while now. <laughs> um chris of course has been having a go for a lot longer than you and i put together yeah. um uh, and yeah you know, so i think the, the 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 thrust of this article actually it talks about the business of podcasting and you know you know, and how it is that people some, some people have made podcasts that have you know high, um, very high production you know, budgets and and very high production standards uh, and they have whole teams of people and they are actual businesses in their own right, the podcasts. And we probably could all name a few from our podcast lists you know, that, that we listen to uh, where that is the case. Um, and then you have people, well, people like us in the future of photography, which uh, is a labour of love. Um, and uh, I have to say, when I read this, I had a chuckle to myself. It's like, you really have only thought about one reason People do podcasting, don't you? Yeah, you know, the the the, the uh, not not heard, not thought about. I think the the democratization of broadcasting, <laughs> about yeah. the the niches, about the passion and the love for a topic, no matter how big or small. Um, and I just wanted to take the the opportunity to say it took me years and probably hundreds of podcasts to figure out why I was doing it. And because I happen to have a slightly entrepreneurial brain, why I wasn't overtly monetizing or trying to monetize any of the podcasts that I was doing. And in the end, it boiled down to just one simple thing, which I'm sure I've said before on this podcast. I know I've said it as much as I can. I just do it to make friends. And I've made friends all around the world uh that i would never have the opportunity to talk to otherwise because i do podcasting and so for me the very answer to this is an unequivocal no the have a go podcast era is not beyond us uh at least for me jeremiah what do you think about that i i i couldn't agree more i i think that that well first of all we understand the kind of uh, the intention of news is to create some controversy to get people to uh kind of click read Discuss, there is that theme to get that. angry. <laughs> so there, there's that. Um, but 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 it's true. Monetization also leads you down another path because you can go. You know, if we avoid this topic and focus on this topic, we can grow another thousand listeners, viewers uh, a week. Uh, but often that economic decision making is the very thing that will uh, eventually bite you in the ass because you know it's the same thing with everything that, that is a novelist someone who wants to write a book who has a book inside and sits down to write it if they're just thinking of the marketplace they will create possibly a really interesting page turner that goes in one direction but they certainly won't write something that is so unique, new, expressive. Both can be successful 
One may sell 10,000 copies and one may sell 500,000 copies. But the long-term response to that book over years and years and years may be very, very different. One may be um, a picture of an age that is so representative of something specific in an individual's view of it. And one may may just be entertainment. Um, so when you are, I mean, in the movie business, we're faced with this all the time. You know, are we, are we acquiring a certain uh, IP in order to, to sell it, or do we just love it and want to see it turned into something else? And we're faced with this all the time. And because movie making, television production is expensive, and it's called the film business, uh, that's always part of the decision. It's also part of, because I've been doing, you know, cinema for many, many, many years, decades. I also take refuge in doing my own artistic practice because I don't I don't need to do it for money. Um, yes, I do exhibit. Yes, I do sell. But that is not my motivation. That is the end result of just not having enough space <laughs> to store all my stuff. <laughs> Let's get it out. But I'm only interested in getting it out. Um, but it doesn't it, it really doesn't influence the choices I make, I make them purely because I want to, where in film, I always have to des- decide how I'm going to risk other people's money. It's the same thing with, with businesses writ large. Podcasting is no different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think so. In, 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 in some ways, in my head, I think podcasting is a bit like having gardening as a hobby, right? It, you know, it, <laughs> you know it's something that helps you to decompress. It's something mm. that that allows yeah. you to connect to things and to people in podcasting, certainly in a, in a different way, um, and allows you, you know, to do to to explore something different. So, so anyway, it was just a, it was just an article I noticed, and I thought, well, you know, let's have a quick chat about it because. Yeah, you know, I think there's there's more than one way to do a podcast, and I'm very happy with the way that we do this one. Well, hopefully, the listeners are too. Both of them, yeah. <laughs> okay, well. let us know in the Discord, folks, if there's anything that we could do better to to absolutely, uh, especially if you want merch, we could do a line of merch. That would be fine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah merch is fine. We could, we'd love to make some money off merch. <laughs> okay, all right. So we um in in the effort to have a shorter podcast, we've probably more or less failed on that, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, we're only going to do one pick of the week though, uh, and this week it gets to be me. Um, so uh, I've spent, uh, as many people, who, well, people who listened to last week's podcast will know, I've just spent a week in Cornwall, which is a, a sort of a family holiday. I had to work some of the time, but that's another story. Um, but uh, one of the things I find, uh, which I probably recommended before, but one of the things I find essential and delightful to use uh, is the little belt holster that I have for my camera. So link in the show notes to a company called Spider Holster. I don't think they sell the product that I bought for them. They sell a good chunky metal one uh, these days for, for professional use. But I had what their, their consumer grade one from years ago, which I think now you can buy on Amazon or eBay for a fraction of the cost. But I'm going to put the link into Spider Holster themselves because it's their product I've got. And they're the ones that put in the effort to develop the products in the first place. Um, so uh, this is just a thing. It's a clip uh, that goes on your belt um, and then you have a little stud that you screw into the tripod mount of your camera and you can just click it in and out of that and it, ho- it hangs off your hip um, you know, without worrying about making your back ache because it's heavy or when you're carrying it around all day. It just get, You don't have to use your hands. You know, it just sits there. It doesn't swing round to the front of your body and, and whack your children in the head at an inconvenient or convenient moment um yeah it's it's just just a great thing so uh for anybody that doesn't like camera straps but also doesn't want to carry their camera around all the time i'd recommend go get one of these hands free hands hands free yeah (laughs) okay and on that note uh we have been the future of photography uh thank you very much for listening to us uh we'll be back next week take care goodbye bye bye You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at 
thefutureofphotography.com. 